Good morning, Chin. Morning, Jenna. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Patman. Where's Estes? I had to let him go. Good morning, Hash Brown. Happy Friday to everybody. Happy, happy Friday. I know it's you. When does the next Batman movie come out? <sighs> Didn't Rob get COVID? Robin? Oh! Rob, uh... Pattinson? Really? Oh. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Robin. And I was concerned. I can't see anything. The peripheral vision is bad. And it's not ideal to be wearing uh, glasses under here. Not gonna work. Fashion comes at a cost. This is the fashion Go Gotham needs right now. It might not be the fashion that Gotham deserves. Fashion is pain. It is the price we pay.
Okay, we gotta get we gotta get started here. Analysis. You guys ready? I hope you're doing well this Friday. How's everybody doing? The sun is out. The weather is beautiful. Okay. I think this is this is cool because we're going to start to do some we're going to start looking at some of the physical implications. Like what does this bicycle model tell us about cars? So we're going to bridge the gap from the math to some of the physical meaning and how this model helps you make decisions about car design or understand how a car is behaving. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're working with a simplified version of the bicycle model, and there's a couple assumptions from this simplified version. So looking at this picture on the left, this is the um, simplified assumption. So the vehicle travels with a constant velocity which you can see over there as capital V. And it travels tangent to the circular arc. And this is a little redundant, but circular arc, that means it's gonna have a constant radius and we're just gonna call that R. Further, the side slip angle, beta, is small. I mean, in the picture, the side slip isn't that small, but just assume just know that that's what we're assuming. So the side slip angle is the angle between where the nose of the vehicle is pointed and where that velocity vector, vector is actually heading. So this is a positive side slip angle shown here because we're looking at the car from the top and um, this clockwise angle, that'll be considered positive. Okay. Now, so we assumed this simplified path. So when we're talking about this simplified bicycle model, imagine it's going in a circular corner and so on. So we also assumed the lateral tire force, because that's the force that's holding the car in this corner. We're assuming that that tire force is predicted by the linear tire model, which is only valid, valid for small tire slip angles. So how small do you ask? I would say somewhere between minus three degrees and positive three degrees. That's what we mean by like a small slip angle. So this is the linear tire model. It says that the lateral force from the front tires is the negative of the cornering stiffness at those front tires times the front slip angle. And we did some geometric slash kinematic analysis last time and we found that the slip angle at the front is related to the steer angle delta the side slip angle beta as well as the yaw rate multiplied by the distance from the cg to the front axle divided by our constant velocity and then 
we also have an expression for the lateral force that comes from your rear tires. It's not just the front tires that give lateral force. So this is gonna be C alpha R times a, a similar looking expression. And I think this is where we wrapped it up last time. We got like the simplified model, we got the lateral tire force, and then we worked on these slip angle expressions to get this equivalent expression. And now we're gonna substitute everything in to the bicycle model. And then we're gonna to start to talk about the physical meaning of this. So this is the simplified bicycle model right here. And so we gotta substitute in these tire forces that we got from this uh, linear tire model. Now there's one more assumption that I've actually neglected to mention up to this point, but we're also going to assume that the steer angle at the tires is small. And how small? Well, small enough that when I take the cosine of that angle in radians, it's approximately equal to one. And so you can see why that's a convenient assumption because I have some cosines here of delta and I can just send them both to one if the steer angle is small. Now, this steer angle, if you remember, it's not how far you've actually turned the steering wheel. It is, let's see if I have my car here. It's how much a tire at the ground is deviating from its like longitudinal straightforward position. So the, the ratio, like when you turn your steering wheel, it's not a one to one turn of the tire. Like if you turn your steering wheel one degree, it doesn't mean the tire steered one degree. And that makes sense because you can, you know, turn your steering wheel over like, what is it, three times or something. That doesn't mean your tires rotated around three times. So there's like a, a ratio in there and it's somewhere around 12. So you have to turn your steering wheel like 12 degrees to actually steer a tire one degree. So, so that's just a quick aside. Delta is not how much you actually turn the steering wheel, it's how much the tire itself is actually steered. Okay. So we're gonna take equation one, which I'm calling this, and we're gonna substitute in the linear tire model. Let's do it. Let's freaking do it. So we're gonna do the rear lateral tire force first, which is C alpha R, R L R over V minus beta. So that's the rear lateral force. And then we have to add the front lateral force, and we're gonna ignore that cosine term because it's going to one. So it's the front cornering stiffness times delta minus beta minus R L F over V. And then we can start to gather some terms. So I'm gonna collect the beta terms together. C alpha R plus C alpha F times beta. So it's just collecting those. Let's collect the yaw rate terms, which are the lowercase r terms. One over V, C alpha R, L R minus C alpha F, L F times R. Okay, so we got the beta terms, we collected the R terms, and now we're gonna collect the delta term, and there's just one of those, plus C alpha F times delta. Okay, and now we're gonna define some terms. So this coefficient of beta, we're gonna call it y sub beta times beta. So the coefficients in front of beta, r, and delta, they're gonna have some special names. And 
these each, if you break into them, they have some physical meaning as well. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're also going to give some typical values for these parameters. And I like to compare a Formula One car to a passenger car. Because the goal of this class is getting from point A to point B as fast as possible and discussing what optimal choices you can make to do that. And a Formula One car is an incarnation of that goal. So it's good to, to look to that. So we call these coefficients the lateral force derivatives. And they're each like a unique character in Lord of the Rings. And they each have their special name with special roles. So let's go through them one by one. Y beta, which is the negative of the combined cornering stiffness of the front and rear, it is called the damping in side slip derivative. And I'll just take the expression from up above and substitute it in here just so we keep track of it. So let's get into the, the physical meaning, this damping and side slip derivative. What does it actually mean for a car? Because if you know the cornering stiffness of the tires of a car, you can determine what this parameter is. So it describes the amount of lateral force generated per side slip angle. And if you look at this, um, cornering stiffness is always a positive number. So this will always be negative. And physically, how it performs, it acts like a damper that resists change in side slip. You could think of a spring mass system you've all looked at systems like this before and basically the function of the damper is to slowly steal energy from the system so that the oscillations never come back to the same place. And so you should think of this term functioning like a damper with respect to um, side slip. Well, your side slip doesn't really oscillate like this in a car. Maybe instead it'll, it'll look something like this, like an exponential without any oscillations or something. But just think of this term as damping out any resist and resisting change in side slip. Okay, let's keep going. That's the damping and side slip derivative. We have this y sub r term. And let's write the, the mathematical expression first, just pulling it from up above. It's one over your speed times the rear cornering stiffness times this distance from the rear axle to your CG minus the front cornering stiffness times the distance between the front axle and your CG. So this is called the lateral force slash yaw coupling derivative. The whole world is a spring mass system. You could, you could say that. Or a series of interconnected spring mass systems. It's an interesting discussion to say like, is the physical 
universe fundamentally a mechanical system? Like, are even chemical and electrical reactions fundamentally mechanical? Because, I mean, we talk about, like, the momentum of a photon and stuff. Just saying, mechanical engineering, right? Okay. Okay, let's, let's look at this. What does this physically talk about? This describes the amount of lateral force generated with an increase in yaw rate. And this can be positive or negative. And this has some implications that I wanna discuss later on with a different um, derivative. And, and we'll do a little example to explain it a little more, but this is very important. Cars can behave very differently depending on the sign of this. Um, one thing I want to point out, because this is divided by V, this gets smaller with increasing speed. So physically, if you try to turn your car left or right, this is going to produce a force that either amplifies the lateral force in the direction that you're turning, or it kind of resists it, depending on the sign. And the whole effect is decreased the faster you're going. Okay. Let's not, let's not spend too much time there. Okay, let's move on to this one. This is the control force derivative, and this one's more simple to explain. It's equal to your front cornering stiffness. Does this V, yes, Chin, that's, um, this is the magnitude of the velocity. So this will always be a positive number, the V. So this control force derivative, it describes the lateral force generated per steer angle. So if you have more cornering stiffness at the front, you have a meatier, grippier tire, this term is gonna increase. Let's give some typical values. We'll give some typical values here to, to help compare. Let's start with this last one, the, the uh, control force derivative, because this one's a little more obvious. So for a passenger car, a typical value is somewhere around 240 pounds per degree of steering. Compared to a formula car, a thousand pounds per degree of steer at the front. Okay, let's go back to Y sub beta. This is minus 436 pounds per degree. And remember this Y sub beta term, it's called the damping in side slip. It acts like a mechanical damper that tries to reduce or uh, to damp out changes in side slip. So for a formula car, this is minus 2,793. So 
if um, if you're going down a straight in a passenger or a formula car, you have no side slip. And then when you head into a corner, that generates some side slip. So effectively, it's gonna feel different going into a corner in a passenger formula car, obviously, but in terms of side slip, the, the change is gonna be damped out a whole lot. There's not gonna be as much side slip in a formula car. Okay. Let's move on to this last one. Now this one, I'll show the term again really quick. It's this, one over V. So it changes with speed. So I decided to calculate this value at 80 miles per hour. And this is a, it's always gonna be a pretty small number. Three pounds per, um, so it's, it's pound force per degree per second because your yaw rate is an angular velocity. So per degree per second, this is going to um, create three pounds of lateral force. And for a formula car, it's actually not much different. So this is kind of a, a less important derivative. Okay, let's move on to our next equation. So, so we don't, so we for, remember what we're doing. We took this first bicycle model equation, we plugged in our tire force model, and then that led to some definitions of lateral force derivatives. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take this second equation, which is, it describes the yaw moment. So like the, the torques acting about the CG of a car as you corner, and we're gonna substitute in these forces. Okay, so equation two, it's gonna become this. The moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. It's gonna be this. Delta minus beta So that's the moment from the front tires. And then you also have this moment from the rear tires. And these produce moments in different directions on the car, which makes sense. You know, if you're turning If you're turning right, and I steer to the right, you're gonna have um, basically a lateral force from your front tire in that direction, a lateral force from your rear tire in that direction, and your CG's in the middle, so your rear tire tends to like rotate the car this way because of the moment, and the front tends to go the other way. And it's actually good that these moments compete because it prevents your car from spinning out. I mean, imagine if the moment was going in the same direction, you would just spin your car around. So there's a delicate balance here. Okay, let's, let's gather some terms. We're gonna gather the beta terms together times beta. And then we're gonna gather the terms in front of the yaw rate. Times R. And the term for the steer angle. And then these coefficients are gonna have their own special names.
So that coefficient is in beta. This coefficient, including that negative sign, in R. So I'll put a plus there. And then C alpha F times LF is going to be in sub delta. Okay, so these are called the yaw moment derivatives. Ooh, and this first one, I think is the most interesting one of all. Probably the most important. It tells you the most about the handling of a car. So that's, I wanna do a, an example with this one too. But this one is called the directional stability derivative. And let's just write it in here. C alpha F L R times C alpha F L F. Okay, let's get into it. So this term describes the yaw moment produced per side slip angle. And depending on how you set up your car, it can be positive or negative or you could try to make it zero and in fact this is what we try to do with formula one cars we try to get it as close to zero as possible and this term is key for classifying the lateral handling of a vehicle because based on the sign of this term we classify cars in different ways okay so let's say that this term is less than zero this is very rare because of the handling characteristics it creates Lewis says is the side slip angle and slip angle the same thing well, sometimes we call the side slip angle the slip angle for the vehicle. You just have to be careful that, like if I have my car, here's this, here's the CG. Uh, let's say the front tire, rear tire. And if we have the velocity at the CG going this way, I mean, this is the side slip angle. The tires also have their own slip angle. Like the velocity at the rear tire might be um, going here or something. And so we also have a slip angle at the rear tire. So we might call these both slip angles, but you just have to be careful if they're with respect to the tire, are they respect to the CG of the vehicle? Okay. If this term is zero, we call it neutral steer, which is a highly desirous characteristic. And then if it's greater than zero, we call it understeer. And this is uh, I'm going to say all passenger vehicles. I don't think you could find a passenger vehicle where this is less than zero. So I'm going to make a bold statement there. 
and I'll say neutral steer. That's like Formula One. They try to create that effect. And oversteer. Maybe some performance vehicles. But it's very dangerous. And and so I want to show you an example that talks about this. Only Sith deal <laughs> in absolutes. Um well, I do have a Darth Maul mask. I haven't brought that out this semester. Maybe I'll have to do that soon. Okay. So let's, let's talk about the physical significance of this with an example. And let's look at how the sign positive negative will affect the dynamics. Okay, so let's look at this vehicle below. It's making a, a right corner. And right now, notice it's, it's nose in to the corner. So the BX body vector is pointing inside the radius. That's what I mean by nose in. And this characteristic of going nose in this happens to all vehicles. There it is again, Finbar, this absolute. It happens to all vehicles at higher speeds. The, the, the speed at which this transition to nose in occurs is different for all vehicles, but all vehicles tend towards a nose in attitude at higher speeds. So for this right turn, Let's draw the side slip angle. So it's measured from the longitudinal body axis to the velocity vector. And in this orientation, this is actually a negative side slip angle because it's counterclockwise from above. Okay, so let's break this down. We're making a right corner. So, this means the yaw rate is some positive number. Because um, the car is rotating this way about its CG as it navigates around this corner to the right. So that's clockwise, that's a positive yaw rate. Depending on the velocity, that dictates what the yaw rate is. Now based on the drawing here, the side slip angle is less than zero because we're at a high enough speed where the car is going nose into this corner. Okay, now we have a contribution to the yaw moment, so the torque about the CG that's caused by side slip, which that is given by in sub beta times beta. So this is the moment just inherently caused by having this side slip angle. Now let's let's break this down. If if in beta happens to be less than 0, that would mean that the product of in beta times beta would be greater than zero because right now we know beta is negative. So if n beta is negative, then that's gonna be a positive number. That means that the moment is also positive. Let's just draw that here. This would be a positive moment. And think about that for a second. And think if that's good or bad. Produces positive yaw moment wants to spin the vehicle 
more nose in. If you look at that torque, it wants to it wants to turn that nose even more in. And increase the side slip even more. Now imagine that you're driving a car in this situation. You're taking a right corner and um, as you're going faster, the nose tends to want to go in more already. Um, and then the configuration of your car is producing a moment that the more nose in you are, the more that it wants to spin the car nose in. And so you would have to steer by like probably turning your tires, you know, the other way, cause you're trying to like, yeah, trying to prevent your car from going nose in. And if you look at this picture, you know, it looks like drifting, right? Like the back is kind of like sliding out, probably making a trail of smoke or something eventually. Well, uh, when you got to turn left to go, yeah. Well, so drifting is kind of intentionally creating a situation like this. Um, let's not get too much into that, but thinking about this just at the most basic level, your car tends to want to push the front of your car nose in and we call this an oversteer vehicle classification. If you're driving a car that tends to do this, we would call it an oversteer car. Okay. Let's, let's think about the other case where in beta is positive. And this is for all passenger vehicles. I'm making a bold statement there. This would mean that the moment on the car produced by the side slip, so we're right cornering, we're nose in at higher speeds. That happens for all vehicles. So my beta is negative because I'm nose in for a right corner, but this term is positive so this produces a negative yaw moment if I'm in an understeer vehicle. So the, the, mo the more nose in I go, the more that the vehicle naturally wants to correct my attitude. Attitude just means orientation. So it wants to push the longitudinal basis vector back in line with the velocity vector and reduce side slip. So the negative yaw moment wants to reduce side slip and push car um, into alignment with the velocity vector. And clearly, I mean, you can see this is more stable. If you start to side slip one way or the other, the car naturally wants to push you back into alignment. And this is an understeer vehicle classification. And I mean for neutral steer, I don't get into that here, but if this derivative is zero, regardless of your side slip angle, it's not gonna create, your vehicle is not naturally gonna create a moment one way or the other. Or if it does, it's going to be very small and negligible. So it doesn't tend to push your car more nose in. It doesn't tend to 
really try to correct your side slip. So um, it kind of puts the driver in full control for better or worse. Okay, I think that one's the most interesting, but let's let's get through these other two as well. N sub R is called the yaw damping derivative. And it's equal to, oops, minus one over your velocity, C alpha F L F squared, plus C alpha R L R squared. So this will always be negative. It's, it's not like the previous term where it could be positive or negative because everything in here is positive, 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 and you throw a negative sign out in front. So this describes the effect of the yaw rate on the yaw moment. And this produces a moment that once again acts like a damper. It's trying to resist change in the yaw rate. So this makes your car more directionally stable. If you start spinning out one way or another, this moment is always trying to resist that from happening, but, but beware, be warned, because this term decreases with increasing speed. Because look at this, you're dividing by the velocity here. So this tendency for your car to align itself or prevent itself from spinning out, it gets um, less prominent at higher speeds. So be careful when you're out there racing. At higher speeds, this damper is less effective at preventing the car from spinning out. Basically, you'll notice at higher speeds, your steering creates more lateral acceleration. Like if you just do, a, if you're going 60 miles per hour and you do just a little bit of steering, it produces way more lateral acceleration than if you're going like 20 miles per hour. Okay. Okay, last one the control moment derivative, C alpha F times LF. So this is the control moment derivative and what does it tell us about a car? It describes the effect of steering on the yaw moment. So how much of a moment is created about the CG per steer angle? And it increases with front cornering stiffness If you beef up your front tires, obviously the steering affects the moment on your car a little bit more. It makes it turn a little zippier. But this is interesting. This also increases as LF increases. So what that means is LF gets bigger if I push the CG towards the rear axle. So this also increases as CG is moved toward the rear axle. That makes sense. Like if you have a car, here's like the front, I'm steering a little bit. If I move the CG like way back here or something, then I have like lateral force produced at the front and it's acting over this moment LF. So if I increase that moment arm, then the effect of steering has a bigger effect. I think uh, Formula One cars, let's see. The, Let's see, maybe LF is something like 60% of the wheelbase. 
and LR is like the other 40%. So a Formula One car actually does shift the CG back a little bit. Okay, we're getting a little short on time. Let's put in some typical values here for these. Okay, in beta. This one, if it's positive, you're understeer. So passenger cars, they're, they're all understeer. It's gonna be positive. And the moment is gonna be something like 367 foot pounds per degree of side slip. And it's always trying to correct the nose of your vehicle. For a Formula One car, this is very small. Ideally, it's around zero. Neutral steer. Okay. This one, this is how your yaw moment changes with your yaw rate. Minus 67 foot pounds per degree per second. So this is like a damper that tries to damp out changes in your yaw rate. It's much more for a formula car. Okay, this last one, the control moment derivative. This is how much of a moment is produced per steer angle. 700 foot pounds per degree of steering at a tire. For a formula car, it's like 6,000 foot pounds of torque per degree of steering. So that's because the cornering stiffness of the front tires is much greater and the CG is pushed further towards the rear axle for a formula car. Okay, let's do, this is the last thing. We're just gonna combine all of these terms to just summarize it. This is our bicycle model written in terms of these derivatives. And when we come back to this, we're gonna put these equations in state space form because that's gonna allow us to do some further analysis. So if you want, you can fill these in in advance. And I guess we'll come back to that Monday, fill that in. And continue this discussion of lateral handling I'm thinking there's some vehicles, like I don't think any production vehicle is oversteer, naturally. But there's some, I think there was like a particular BMW model that was pushing it a little bit. Audi. And I want to be careful here because like when people talk about oversteering, that's different than a car inherently being oversteer. Like when you 
when you drift, going back to this picture, you, um, actually this is interesting, let's see. When you drift, you have like the rear tires skidding, right? And that effectively, let's see, if I go back here, yeah, like this is the moment produced by your rear tires, basically. When you go into a drift and you start sliding your rear tires, the moment produced by the rear tires becomes small. Because when tires are sliding, they're not producing a lot of force. So then your front tires are still gripping the road and it makes this term less than zero. So it creates a situation where this is happening. And um, that's why when you're drifting, you have to turn your tires back the other way to try to prevent your car from going more nose in, which is what the car naturally wants to do when that term is negative. Fly Little says, I think the Chevy Corvair may have had oversteer when it was in production. Chevy Corvair oversteer. <laughs> the One of the articles that comes up is, will a Corvair kill you? What? Unsafe at any speed. Called the Corvair, the one car accident. Oh, okay. The rear suspension made the car likely to flip over. What? Wait, maybe we should just watch this. In 1965, a young lawyer named Ralph Nader published a book titled Unsafe at Any Speed, which was a harsh critique of automotive safety. One chapter of the book was dedicated to the curious handling of the Chevy Corvair. Nader called it the one car accident. So I've arranged to drive a Corvair, and not just any Corvair, but one owned by Ralph Nader himself. I've rented a wide open runway, and I'm here to find out, essentially, <laughs> will the Corvair kill me? Oh, jeez. Find in the 50s. During a time when the average American car lumbered down the road carrying two tons of steel and rubber, Wait, and the post-war exuberance was still in full swing. And with a price of less than 2,000 bucks, it was cheap, and it provided families with an alternative form of transportation. At the time, General oh. Motors sold roughly Chevy had big plans for the car. In Nader's book, he called the Corvair the one car accident. He wrote that a design flaw in the rear suspension made the car likely to flip over when driven in abrupt maneuvers, like, say, avoiding a ball that suddenly rolled into the street. Uh. The book was a bestseller and has been linked to the Corvair ever since. For Ralph Nader, it was very successful, yes. Say hello to Peter Kaler. Now, I love listening to Kaler. He's Former obviously engineer. so emotionally invested in the car. When you hear him talk about Nader, there's almost a little tinge of anger in his voice. He presented the work in a fashion that sold books and got people's attention. I think that's probably the best way to put it, okay? Pete's a former <laughs> GM like engineer and a Corvair fanatic. I've got 15 Corvairs, I believe. We're supposed what? to be a group of rugged individuals. The car companies had long since engineered around the regulations. 
horsepower was back, and climbing. The death rate since 1965 had dramatically dropped, and our cars are now far safer and cleaner. The claim against the Corvair was it was defective design. So that meant two things. One is that every Corvair was defective. And two, it was a slight on General Motors engineering that they would engineer a defective car. We felt it had to be vigorously defended, which we did. The Corvair doesn't automatically roll over and die. The Corvair <laughs> doesn't cause you to be a bad driver. If you know what you're doing, you can drive the Corvair. If you know what you're doing, you can drive a Volkswagen Beetle or a 356 Porsche, which all had the same suspension system that Ralph said was unsafe at any speed. That really isn't true. The problem was too much weight transfer at the rear for mm. two reasons. One, swing axle has a high roll center, which contributes to weight transfer. Because of the weight back there, the coil springs were stiffer. And so that added to the roll stiffness as well. So fully 80% of the weight transfer and cornering was on the rear tires, and that's what caused it. Did you? Oh, this is going to be fun once we get into load transfer. We need to bring this back. So when you turn, the load goes from the inside tires, and it, it puts more load on your outside tires. So then the question is, well, how much load is going to go on your uh, like front outside tire versus the rear? And this guy is saying that 80% of the transfer from inside to outside happens at the rear. So like all of the load is going onto this like back uh, right tire. Now that has another component, which means that most of the load lost at the inside track happens at the rear uh, inside tire. So that's so this rear inside tire is the tire that's going to pick up off the ground first, and it's gonna you're gonna flip over. To, to un oversteer and eventually go out of control. Oh. Okay, what these guys are trying to say is that the Corvair was... And that's also, that also comes back to... Um, that also comes back to oversteer because that effectively reduces the cornering stiffness at the rear. So now the rear tires are not creating the moment that helps keep your car aligned. And so you just tend to spin nose in. So you're flipping over and you're turning nose in. Is that what was going on? It caused it to, to un oversteer and eventually go out yeah, of Yeah, look at it. It's going nose in. Okay, what? To un oversteer and eventually go out of control. Nose in and it flips over. <laughs> okay, what these guys are trying to say is that the Corvair wasn't flawed as much as it was designed with a unique purpose, and that was economy. Its it was rear suspension with the was simple, of flipping over. so it could be made cheaper, and consequently, it sold for less than two thousand dollars. The idea here was a family car. They were entered Have in your the family flip mobile over. gas economy runs back then. They got over thirty miles to the gallon. They, they won their class several years. That's Have I seen the video of rear suspension without damping? I haven't seen that that sounds that's really how Ed Cole that sounds like another car. good one just a bread and butter get to the grocery store and back economical cheap to buy cheap to maintain kind of a car the way it's operated uh, is different from any other car and if you don't know the differences you could cause yourself to be in a situation that's hard to recover from now is that the fault of the engineer was that the fault of the company that, in, that built the car and sold it or is that just somebody forgot to follow the rules um. Now before you call me reckless, you should know a few things. I've been racing and testing cars for over 20 years. I've been to numerous racing schools, driving is my life, and while I'm not a professional race car driver, I know what I'm doing behind the wheel. I've also rented the perfect facility for these maneuvers. It's an airport with hugely wide runways, nothing to hit, and plenty of runoff. I've known Larry for a while. I trust his ability to drive. My major thing is Larry knows how to go fast and Larry knows when to say whoa. But even still, I'm nervous. I start slowly. I turn the wheel. I'm unsure what's gonna happen. In the back of my mind is that crash footage that's all over YouTube. 
that shows the thing spinning yep. out and rolling. I don't know how strong this roof is, but it's nowhere near as stout as the roofs on today's Yeah, there's no floor. roll cage in here. I've got a helmet, I've got a lap belt, but I've also got three kids at home. The way cars can be rolled easily, many cars can be rolled easily, is to make a hard turn yep. in one direction to get the body to roll as far as it will go, and then suddenly turn it in the opposite direction to add momentum to that roll. As I start picking up speed, cutting the wheel back and forth, I can feel the rear end get light. Mm. When you're racing, a car that oversteers like this is a huge benefit. Yeah, that You can use both ends of the car gonna, like, to navigate off. turns quicker than you would otherwise. This one. I like it. It's fun. The swings get wider. They happen more abruptly. It doesn't feel like it's catching. Hey, have a great it day, It feels Barry. like it's gradual, almost graceful in its moves. But again, hey, I've got a, a perfect Friday, situation Jenna. here. A perfectly maintained car. Good luck on your midterm, guys. The car does what it is designed to do. And the question is, is that worse than the alternative? Say another driver does the same thing in a 1960 Chevrolet Impala. Now the Impala probably wouldn't spin, but instead it wouldn't make the turn at all. Now since every situation is unique, it's impossible to say which Every outcome is preferable. Impact. Between the two, however, the Corvair probably has the better chance of avoiding that ball that rolled into the street. I think of the Corvair as a sacrificial lamb that motivated Nader to write a book that got the industry to make some initially painful changes that ultimately proved necessary. Mm. That's an interesting story. We're going to bookmark this. Thanks for sharing that. All right, people. That's it for today. Have an awesome Friday. Have an awesome weekend. Um, get some rest. Enjoy the sunshine. And I'll see you guys on Monday. Peace. Back to work. Yeah, see you, Offworlder. I'll have to check out that other video. Rear suspension without damping. Don't let me forget about it. All right, peace.